So welcome to the second lecture. Uh, today I will be covering quite a lot. So I will continue finishing the uh, first part of the Python language uh, lecture. And then we will continue on to the non by uh, part where we go through array computing with matrices, just very like MATLAB. Uh, but that will be the second thing. So we left off with uh, basically covering the looping techniques, uh, variable types, and now we we'll continue to functions and subroutines. So uh, functions are a way to group code together, to modularize your code to um, into logical blocks. And in Python, functions defined uh, is created using the def uh, keyword. So def, and then you give a name to the function, in this case, it's print dot. Uh, and then you have a parenthesis with all the parameters. And the function can be have uh, no parameters, then you just give an empty parenthesis. And then as we, with uh, other constructs that have code blocks associated to it, you start with a colon uh, that indicates that following this line, there will be a code block. So here I have an indented code block and the print statement here belongs to the print function or the print dot function. So let's define this. And then you call a function just like you call the print statement in your code before. You just give the name and the parenthesis, and that will call the function. You see here, it, it printed out the text here in the functions. Uh, and in many cases, you want also to provide some parameters to your function. Uh, what you do then is just you list your parameters in the uh, between the parameters. So in this case, I have print value and an A. So A is an input parameter to the function. Uh, and you can see here that I can use the uh, input parameter just like any other Python variable inside a function. So here I give a variable B42, and then I pass that value to the function. And the variables you pass to the function doesn't have to have the same name as the function uh, parameters. Uh, those are translated over. So uh, inside a function, uh, the, the B reference here will be A. So you can see here it passes along 42 to the, the B uh, into the function. It is printed out using uh, the print statement here with the A here. So B passes the reference of 42 to function, and then A is the reference inside the function for that variable. So what about what happens if you change a variable, a parameter that you is passed to a function? So let's say we have this here, print value A, we modify the function here, but we change A equals to 84. What do you think will happen to B in this case? Will it change? Let's try it out. Oh, the value B is still 42, even if we changed the parameter inside the function. And that is because the, the B is a, um, you pass along the reference. And when you do this statement here, that actually creates a new variable reference. So 84 here is actually a, a, a new, it allocates in memory, new and memory location. And then A, as all variables in Python are references, if you do A equals 84, now A points to 84. But A is not the same as the outside variable B. So in this case, the first part here, it prints out 42, which is the incoming value here. Uh, but this here has no effect of the external variable. You, you can't change variables uh, coming into a function, inside a function. However, you want sometimes to be able to pass things out of a function. Uh, and that you, you do with uh, something called return values. The return value uh, is returned using the returns uh, statement and the value. Um, it works like uh, just like a normal function in MATLAB as well, that's, that you call the function with a variable, and on the left side, you assign the return value. So return scene x for the function here will assign y scene of x. It's also possible to return multiple values from a function. Then you just give them 
uh, with a, a comma separated list here on the return statement, and you cache them here using x comma y. So a test here will be called, and the return x and y will be assigned x and x divided by two. Uh, there is a um, so you did this rule with not you can't modify things inside a function is not entirely true. So for example, if you pass a list to a function, in this case I have a here and I have a, a, a okay. function modify list b here, and then b zero is equal to four two. Uh, you call modify list here, pass the reference to the list here a. And let's see what happens. We can see here that the list is modified. So lists is an exception to rule. You can modify lists inside a function. Uh, but you have to do it using the index in here. So B has a reference to the list. And you modify the first item in the list. Uh, and then A, a is actually, so they both point to the same memory location of this list, both B and A point to the same, and then you can modify the list here inside. Still that you think about this, that this, this could actually happen. So uh, just to break off here, if you have your laptops here, you can try to implement the function here, this one here, and you can do the implementation here on this row, and uh, just try it out and see if you can and create a function f that has the this expression here. But again, it, it, then you have to have the lecture open. You have to press the connect button here to start up uh, the Python interpreter. Uh, and then when you are done, you can try your code using the play button in the left. Here. So uh, if you're done, I, I will show you, uh, just explain how it is. So you start with a def, and then you have to give it the functional name, in this case, f. And you also have to give it an input parameter, in this case, x. And every uh, function or for you working uh, needs a code block. So you have to start uh, the, the code block with a colon on the first row. Press enter, you can see here that it indents the, the function or the, the code. Then I press right return because I need to return a value from this function. I just can remove this statement. Uh, then we have two times x uh, squared. Then you can do two times x like this. So yes. double uh, multiplication is, is uh, the power. And then plus two times x plus three. And if you run this, it should work. You can try it out. Uh, print f of zero. So now it, it passes x into here, and it should be three here. So that was a, let's give you some, so you can try it out yourself. So now we have given you one way of organizing your code that is into functions. And uh, programs that we develop here will be large. They will have multiple functions. And we, we need also a more sophisticated way of organizing functions into groups. And in Python, uh, that um, way, uh, the mechanism for that is modules. And a modules is really, um, you have already used some of this. So the import statement here, that tells uh, your uh, Python that you want to access the functions in the math yeah. group. That imports that module into your own code. And then you can access using math.sim here, because that is a, the, the sim function is built into the math module. Uh, However, sometimes you don't want to 
put map dot this prefix on everything you import. Um, so what you can do is you can do import math, uh, and then the star here means that I want to import every function in the math module. Then all the functions will be imported into my own environment, and you can access them without the prefix. It's also possible to import just uh, single functions. So from math import sin and square root, that will only import those functions into your own execution environment. Um, and that is faster than doing the star import. Uh, the nice thing, uh, so uh, Python has a lot of built-in modules, but it's really easy to create your own modules in Python. So every source file you create in Python is also a module. So if you give a file named uh, mymod.py, you can import us as mymod without extension. So everything is a module by default. So it's really easy. You don't have to create anything special. You just create files, and you can import them and use them as modules. So in this case here, I have a, this is an example of a file. I could call it prime.py. This is really it's a bit difficult to do in a in a notebook. So that's why I'm I'm showing you. You create a file with the contents here. You can see here I have a. I import a math uh, routine square root because I need that. And I have a function called is prime here that uh, returns true if it's a prime number given into the function. Uh, I store that on a, in, in my file directory. In this case, I just download that into my notebook. So you can see here, I downloaded this file here and put it in the notebook. So if you do this on uh, in your own computer using Visual Studio Code, you create a new file, prime.py, put the code inside that. Create a new file with your main program, and then you import Prime into your own file. So in this case here, uh, I import Prime. So that will, will look in your directory where you have your code, uh, look for a file called Prime.py, import it. So we run it here. Yes, you import this. Uh, and then you can use all the functions in that module. So in this case, I can do print, print Prime is Prime. Uh, then it will uh, run this. And so this is prime number. And it's false. So this way you can group similar functions together and put them into a module where you can use separately. Um, so that was modules. Uh, so when you run the Python script, uh, hello. So, so Python really doesn't have a, a main program like you have in many other languages. You can execute any Python file and it will be your main program. Uh, and that also puts a bit, uh, you need to handle where you start the program. And you also need to be able to figure out if you are uh, importing a module or you're running a module. So you have to decide on that. And to just illustrate it, I have a, Special module called Prime Extra here. Uh, there is a, a, a special variable name that we can query uh, that contains the module name if we import it. So let's just download this one here. And if I import Prime Extra here, you can see here I have a print statement here that prints out the name. And if I import Prime extra, it prints prime extra. So if a module is imported, the name is the module name. But if I execute the same module, so I execute prime extra, uh, the module name is not the module name, it's main. So the way you can determine if, if a Python file is imported or run standalone is by use query this name variable. And in that way, you can create a starting point of the application and also enable you to use a module both as an import statement or as running it. Because if you run um, module, you don't want it to execute code, you just want to define the function. So you need to be able to do, separate this. And what you can do, and what you can see if you look at code on the, on the web, is many codes contain this kind of structure here. So this is my main file here, prime main. It imports prime. And then if name equals to main, then I should do something. 
so in this case, uh, if I import prime main, name is prime main, and this will not be executed. But if I run this code uh, using press play in, in the Python Visual Studio code, it will execute this one. So running here, you can see it will print those statements. If I import prime, nothing will happen. So the main program in Python is basically this one here. You don't have to do it. You can you can say that okay, this is my main source code file. I always run this file. I don't have to do anything. But you can have um, enable you to import prime this prime main as well. Use it as a module. But in this case, you can also use it to execute here. But it's, so if I if I would have imported without this, it will also execute this one. Here. So if you don't have that in your port, all code in a module will be executed. Okay, so on, on the exercise yesterday, uh, some of you asked for how you format the output of print statements. And in fact, Python has a, a really advanced way of formatting output from text. So uh, in this case here, I have four variable here and if a floating point, I have integers and I have a string. Then I have a, a form string here. This is, you can see it stated, Look at this at the template. So you can see that there is a dot format here, and you just list your parameters here. Those will be inserted here in these placeholders and replaced with the values of the variables. So if I run this here, you can see here that it inserts two at this position, adds the comma here in the space, and then you have the 45 of zero, 1500, and my string. So this is a simple form of creating templates for output. Uh, you can also give an order. So if you don't want, if you have a, these variables A, B, C, and D, and you want them in a different order in your uh, output, you can do that by specifying a number here. So in this case, I go in reverse. So the third parameter is first and then going down. So now you see it the other way around. Uh, in addition to just Placing uh, placing numbers in a, in the string, you can also format them in different ways. So, for example, if I have a string here, and I want this string, I want a table, for example, that has fifty spaces for numbers, or or, or a string, I can give that number here. So, uh, in this case here, those two first is just to illustrate the length length. So those are not part of the formatting uh, formatting model. So. The curly brackets here, colon 15, tells that I have a, I want to do this text field will be 15 characters long, but you can see here, this is not 15 characters. And if we run this, you can see it places a string on the left side and fill it up with uh, spaces here until it has a field that is 15 characters long. You can also do, uh, if you don't want them to end up on the left side, you can use uh, uh, the greater than sign here to actually move the text to the other side. In this case, it will be output to the left of the, or the right side of the field. The default is left. Uh, you can specify it with a, a greater than or less than if you want to have it on the left side. Uh, it's also possible to have it centered and use the circumflex operator. Then it places the text in the middle. You can also specify which uh, character to use for the, the, the field character. So what, what it should use to fill out the spaces that are not used. In this case, here I use an under, underscore here. And you can see here, it, instead of using spaces, it uses underscore characters to fill out the string. So this was formatting, uh, formatting of strings. Uh, so sometimes, I mean, the most useful thing is, or most problematic is when you have floating point numbers and integers and you want to create nice uh, result tables that the fields are of the same size so that they come on top of each other and not kind of float around when you just do print statements normally. So uh, if you want to format integers, you use the D characters here. So 
in this case, colon D means this, uh, I'm formatting an integer. And then I specify here 42. Uh, and I, now just, this is kind of useless because there's not so much we can do with format. But you can, you can specify the width, and then you put the, the width or the field before the D character here. And you can see here that you can use the same left, right, as we did with the screen. Uh, and also you can use the fill out here. So you can specify the field width for an integer and, and you can, you can uh, change the position of where the number should go. Floating point is a bit more complicated. Uh, same thing here, you have the width for the field and you have a dot and then you have the number of decimal places. So I have two, four and six here. So you can see here 3.14, two decimals, four and six decimal places. And of course you can have, you can use it in, in a, using, so F is fixed form. Uh, and then you have scientific notations with E. But this is two decimal points plus, and then the scientific notation. Uh, and of course, you can also use the, the less, uh, less than or greater than to move the uh, number in the field as well. So by using this, you can you can actually create nice text tables uh, when you're printing. Another cool thing is that you can also use identifiers instead of uh, the order. So if you give a template like this with x comma y. You can specify here in the former statement x comma y y variables, and x will be placed where x is here, and y will be replaced on the y side. It's also possible to pass a dictionary of key value pairs, and then the, the, the keys will be specified in the template text, and then you just pass along uh, with a double star. The double star here is really important, so you have to have that. It's a bit strange notation, but you need to have that too. Possible. If you run this, you can see it takes the values of the dictionary and places them value one, value two, value three. Another thing in Python that is really cool is that um, every variable in Python is stored in a dictionary. So uh, you can actually query all the variables you have using a special function called globals. If we run this one here, you can see here that it lists you a dictionary uh, with all the variables and functions we have defined in the entire code. So this is the all the variables we define in the notebook. And what we can do here, so if we define value one, value two, value three, uh, we can actually pass the global dictionary into the formatting statement and use the variable names directly here in the format. Okay. So in that way, you can you can format the, the, the value printing in, in many different ways. Uh, and uh, for computational codes, this is actually one of the important stuff. If you if you write a simulation, you want to present the results uh, in a report, for example. You need to do that report and format it so it's readable. So formatting is important here to create these reports. So finally, reading and writing files. Uh, this is actually one of the more important um, aspects of uh, when you're writing applications of any kind. You need to get input. And it's not practical for users to, to kind of enter text numbers and press enter. You need, you probably have a lot of data that you need to read in and process. And that is done using files. And in, in Python, you can both create files and you can read files. And uh, uh, to, to, to start to, to create the file, uh, you use the open statement. And what open state, the open statement does is it takes uh, one, two parameters. One parameter is the file name. Second parameter is what you want to do with the file. So in this case here, I have text file open my file dot text, and then I have W here that stands for write. So when I do this, it creates a file object. So instead of uh, working with the file directly, you have a like the, the ticket for uh, the 
the other object that is with your clothes uh, in the restaurants, you have a ticket but to a file instead. And, and that object you can use to write to that file. Uh, you can also close that file when you're done. So now we open the file. So now we have a handle to a newly created files uh, in our file system. And you can actually see if you press the folder, so you should be able to see uh, my file.txt. It has created a file already. It's empty, but it's there. Uh, to write to the file, there are methods connected to this object. Just like we have the split function in the string, we have a write method to actually do something with this file. So in this case, uh, you use write, and then you put pass strings. Uh, this write is not is it similar to the print statement, but it doesn't do a new line after after each write statement. In this case, it writes file thin as in all, and then it stops. And then if you do a write again, it continues where it left off and continues right into that position. So if you want to have new lines in your file, you actually need to pass a backslash n. That is the character to another yeah. one. And I go to the next line. So I run this. And when you are done writing to your file, uh, you need to close the file. Basically, tell the operating system, I'm, I'm done writing to this file. And this is really important because many operating systems, they, they actually don't write to the files directly. So files are written in memory to be efficient. And when you are done with them, they are written down to disk. So um, when you do close, you tell the operating system, Windows or Mac or Linux that, OK, I'm done. So now you can write the file down to disk. So and um, this this is just a system command here on, on the Google Cloud how to print the contents of the file here. So that stands for show me contents. So you can see here that the first uh, write statement went here. The second one, because we didn't have a backslash n, continue writing to this the same row of the file. And then we had a backslash n here, and then it continued to this line here. Um, so that was writing to a file. So another uh, uh, way of using file is to read existing files and get the data into the files. This could be, for example, uh, in the final element code, you have a, your geometry input or your input description of your problem in a file, and you want to read it in and then do a computation, write files to results files. So if you want to read in, we use the same uh, command, open. So we, but instead of using write here, we say, okay, we want to read R from the file. And that creates a file object again. But now we, we uh, use the read statement instead of the write statement. And in Python, there are multiple ways of reading th things into to, uh, from a file. Uh, the simplest thing is just to, to do write. Oh, sorry. To read uh, that actually reads the entire file and puts it into string. So in this case, I get the entire file contents here in a single variable. Same thing with, with writing, you need to close the file to tell the operating system I'm done reading. I should because sometimes when you open the file for reading it, the operating system locks the files, preventing it from being modified from other programs. So it's important to close even if you're just reading the file. Um, Okay, I have to open it as well. So if you see here, I printed. So now I have the, the entire file in a single string variable here, which I printed out. There is a problem with this. And that is that if you have a file that contains uh, gigabytes of information, you will have a string that is one gigabyte large and it will be allocated in memory in the computer and it could crash your computer. So reading the entire contents of the file is only applicable in, in for small files. So if you want to read larger files you, uh, and process the information, you have to have a, another way of doing it. And one way of doing it is using the read line command that will read a single line of a text file uh, into a string. So in this case here, uh, I open my file again. And you can see here, uh, first I read a line. And if you are at the end of the file, read line will return an empty string. So you can have a while statement here that reads, uh, if the line is not empty, continue reading. So in this case, I, I read line, and then I, if not, I, I continue reading, 
and put put the file the printing out of the contents of the each line. Now you can see something that uh, so uh, interesting here. So there are a space between each print statement. And that is because the read line statement reads the backslash and it reads the character return in the file. Uh, so when you print, print will also do another line. So that's why first it's printed out, goes to the next line, and print continues to the next line here. So it will be uh, the, twice the distance here or more between the rows here. If you want to avoid that, you can, you can, we can uh, look at the functions we learned yesterday of the, uh, the string uh, method. So we can strip off the large character turn of the string using R strip. That will remove that backslash n that we're ready. And now we have two lines of strings. Um, you will see here that there's a lot of ways of doing the same thing in Python in different ways. So one, one way you can also do is that you can do uh, you can actually use a for loop to iterate over the text file. So for line in text file, that means that, that it reads the first line, prints it out, reads the next one, uh, just like you iterate through a list. That's it, same result here. You still need to do the R strip here. Uh, there's also one another way that that also it can be convenient sometimes. You can use the, the read lines function, and that reads uh, all the lines in the file and puts them in a list. So it saves you a lot of work. And uh, then you can iterate over the, the, the list instead of looping directly over the file. You read the lines in here, and then you can close the file directly, and then you can process the lines that you're reading. So you can see here now I have a line here uh, in, the, in the list, and I have next time here in the second line. Uh, one thing that has been introduced in the later version of Python is, is a way of automatically closing files. So because it's so important to, to close file resources, uh, they decided that we need some way of automatically doing this. So what they did is introduce the with statement. So with is basically the same thing as opening a file object, but it does it in a more structured way. So with open my file as read as text file, text file will get the, the object, the file object. Then you have an indentation here and have a code block here. So inside this code block, you work with the file. And when you exit the code block, Python will make sure that it call, calls close on the text file. So you don't you don't have to call close on this. It's automatically handled for you. So that, that is a good way of kind of reminding you to make sure that it always happens. Um, also, you saw that I did some errors here in my, my lecture here. Um, we need to think when you code, especially in large programs, you need to think about handling errors because the user will give your program, for example, the wrong file. Um, and you need to handle that in, in, in some way. Uh, so in this case here, uh, I have my file name here. I'm trying to run this example. Uh, and in this case here, I, I, I check first before I read something, I use a, a module called OS uh, and I check if the file already exists. If it exists, I open it and read it. Otherwise, I print out it, it couldn't be found. This is a perfect way of handling errors. It can be complex if you have many different cases you want to take, check for. Uh, most of the functions in Python already has a lot of errors, error uh, states or errors they can uh, send out. So if, if something is wrong in your file, for example, if I have something wrong with my string here, you can see here it, it generates a syntax error. Um, also, if, if the file exists or, or you, have some, you can get different errors. And this here is called an exception. So it's when Python doesn't know what, how to continue, it throws an exception and the code stops. Um, you can catch these exceptions and you can handle them. So for example, here, uh, if I run this file, this my file doesn't exist. If I run the code, you can see here, okay, 
why not found error? They didn't find the file, it stopped the code. And then it, it threw, threw the exception file not found error. And we can handle that using exceptions. And then you use a, a special code block called try and accept. So try says that, okay, the following, I, will, I want to try this code block here. If you find any exceptions, go to this part here. If I run this now, you, 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 could, you handle the exception flow. So even if there was an error in, the, in that first part of the code, I caught it and I, could, I, can, I can control the error flow myself. I can, I, can, I can print out, I couldn't open the file myself instead of showing this ugly Python error message here, which, is, which the user should not see unless you are really into Python programming. Um, the problem with this is that it catches every exception. Uh, so every error you have in your code above, even if we put, uh, let's see if I do some syntax error here. Okay, syntax error. I can't just for a moment not find a good error to simulate here, but if uh, I can say, okay, can we run this A equals to um, float? Then it says, then it couldn't could it open. No, so I do it before this. It, it uh, responds to all errors in the code with the same error message because everything is an exception. And if I if I uh, run this one here outside my try statement here just to show you what exception is true, you can see here I got the value error exception here. But because I did try accept, I catch every exception, uh, which can be dangerous. So what what I what you should do here instead is actually check what, what the exception you want to handle. So in, in the case of the file not found, I can actually specify if I get an exception file not found, then I print it out. And if I try A equals to float hello here, and I run this code, it does not handle the value error. So you still see that something happened. But if the file was, was not found, it will handle that exception separately. So if I run this one here, it's here. And then you can you can actually respond to multiple exceptions. So you can add more things here. So file not found, I can have permission error. For example, if we are not allowed to read a file, it will show permission error. I can have a accept value error here. If I put my example again with a float, I can put that here in the price uh, A equals to float hello. And then it should actually respond to the correct line here. Couldn't convert the float. So in this way, you can, you can handle different errors. Uh, and also, if there are some unknown errors you, you uh, haven't thought about, it will be, Python will stop the program and show you what exception it could. You can also find it here, is you can also get more information from the exception. So uh, an exception is actually an object in Python. So you can you can catch that object as well, just, just not only the exception name. So final found error as E. So the final found error object actually has the file name that it couldn't open. And some, some other uh, exceptions have, for example, the, the message that, uh, the text message that, that it uh, displays in a string here. So each string error here will show you the actual error string. So here it says, you, it actually specifies here, my file.txt couldn't be opened. Um, 
just final here before we end this part here. Um, it's also possible to um, handle something after an exception. So if you need to clean up something that, that really, really bad happened, that even if you have an error, I need to do some cleanup, you can add a final statement to the try clause here. And this will, will execute regardless of there was an error or not. So this part here is guaranteed to, to execute. So this was my first part. So uh, we will have a 50 minute break and then we uh, continue with NumPy. Um, so the final part here will be an introduction to uh, NumPy, uh, which is an extension to handle a large array of the same data type. So we saw in the previous lectures that we use lists for storing um, numbers and text and string, and that is really not efficient if you want to do computing on, on matrices and arrays. So NumPy is a, a Python module. It's actually not implemented in Python, it's implemented in, in C and uses uh, really high performance uh, kernels to compute very quickly uh, products and uh, ma uh, matrix matrix multiplications and matrix vector random multiplication. It can even use multiple processes, you know, multiple cores in your computer to do this computation as well. So using NumPy, we there is a convention here that you will probably see in, in many links on, on the web how to use NumPy and that you import it using import NumPy as NP. And the reason we do this is because uh, NumPy contains a lot of functions that are also in the math library in Python, math module in Python. So to avoid clashes, you import it and, and give it a prefix called NP. So most of the, the examples I will show will have the np dot prefix on all the functions. That is just to kind of indicate this is a NumPy function. Uh, the import, most important object in, in NumPy is the array object. An array object uh, is a homogeneous uh, part of the memory with, uh, the, with a certain data type defined. So all the elements in the array have the same data type. So you can't mix and match like you can in a list strings, numbers, and so on. You have to say, this is a floating point array, this is a Boolean array, this is a integer array. Um, so you can't change that afterwards. Uh, you create uh, array objects, um, and there are multiple ways of creating array objects, but one of the simplest form is using numpy.array. The first argument here is the items in your array. But these are extremely small, so they could have also been lists, but to, to show an example here. And then you also uh, give it a or optional can give it a data type. So in this case, it creates a floating point array. So you can see here it has one. And you can see that it's floating point because all the numbers have a dot decimal point. If you don't specify, uh, NumPy will try to figure out what kind of data type you, you are giving. So if you're giving it integers, it will be an integer array. So in this case here, as I give it one, two, three, it will be an integer array. You can also see there is no decimal points in the print statements. You can also say when you print an array, it will print it, format it like an array as well. So you can see it gives you a square brackets here. Uh, and if you give it floating point, it will figure out, okay, you, you will probably want a floating point. So I create a floating point array. And as I said, they can only have the same data type. You can't mix and match data types inside an array. So when you create it, you give it the, the, the data type. Uh, you can also create multi-dimensional uh, multi arrays. Uh, and in this case here, you, you give it the nested list here for, for value. So the first list here is the row, first row, and then the second row is three, four. And then you can have, in this case, you would have a two row matrix with four columns. And you can see when you print them out, it prints them out with the correct dimensions. Uh, so arrays are, uh, it's a common misconception that arrays are stored in, in, uh, with the dimensions in, in computer memory. 
But computer memory is always linear. It's only going from one address to a certain address. So uh, arrays is just a way of looking at uh, linear uh, chunk of memory in the computer uh, as a two-dimensional construct. But it's actually in real life, the values are stored in one long uh, single row of column. Uh, and there are two ways of storing arrays in different languages. So because it's, uh, uh, NumPy is implemented in C, it stores array uh, um, row-wise. What that means is that if you have an array like this, uh, in memory, it's stored uh, starting with the first row, going to the next row, and so on. So you can see here that you have one, two, three, seven, nine, zero, and then it starts two, five, three, eight, four. So in memory, this array is stored just like a long, long line of numbers. In Fortran, uh, you store uh, uh, the, the array column-wise. Then you go in the other direction. So you go column by column instead. And number can actually handle those kinds of arrays as well. Then you have to give it a certain, certain option uh, when you create them, and it will create them as a Fortran storage array. because. Uh, Fortran and C and C++ are important numerical languages. And uh, for even if Fortran is an uh, old language, it's still developed and modernized and used in computation. So that's why NumPy also handles storing column wise. Um, when you have created uh, arrays, you can query the, the shape and, and size of the different properties of, of the array. And one of the more uh, the important one is the, the, the shape attributes. So you can see here, I created three different arrays and then and I query the shape of these and print the shape out. And you can see the shape is a um, couple, so it, it's a non-changeable list. And for the first one here, single uh, row vector, it's four comma and there is nothing. Then if it's a two-dimensional array, the shape is two by two. And a three-dimensional array, you have two by two by four. So this is a way of, of if you get an array in a function, you want to query what the sizes of it is, you can use the shape attribute of that object. So one way of using it is to, for example, if I want to know the rows and columns of a two-dimensional array, I can do R comma C, and then I do assign B shape to those, and variables R and C will be the rows and columns of that array. In this case, two by two. You can also query the number of dimensions uh, in an array. So there is an ndim attribute that you can query. You can see, so for V, that's a two dimensional array. So ndim is two. So this is the way, for example, if you have functions that handles arrays, you can, you can check that the input is actually correct of the right shape and right dimensions. Uh, there are several other attributes here as well. So shape and ending are covered. B type is the data type. So in this case, float, integer, so on. Uh, size is the number of elements in the array. And item size is a special one. It's uh, how many bytes a uh, single entry in the array uh, occupies. So for example, for a floating point that usually is uh, eight bytes, uh, integer is usually four bytes. So if you want to determine this, the, how much storage is actually using, you can query the item size in this size. So here you can see here that I have, it's an integer array, uh, 64 here, that's a, that's a 64 bit. So it's eight byte integer. So it's a long integer here. Um, number of elements is four. So you can see one, two, three, four. And the item size is eight. So each element takes up eight bytes. Uh, you can change uh, the, the shape of the array uh, using the reshape method. Uh, and as long as the, the number of elements in the array doesn't change, reshape is a, a non-costly operation. It's just an interpretation of the array, how it's viewed. Uh, and and uh, NumPy is really good at avoiding reallocating arrays so that, uh, because reallocation 
reallocate the memory in the computer is a um, cost that takes a lot of computational time. So you don't want to do that unnecessarily. Uh, here I created a function here to actually query uh, where uh, uh, array is stored in memory. So actually technically you can ignore it. So this is this function memory of A returns the memory location of a, an array. Uh, so just to illustrate that when you reshape uh, an array, so in this case I have a two by two array and I want to reshape it into a four by one. Uh, flat array. So reshape here will return a reference to the array in the four by one form. Um, just like we talked about the array, uh, the variables are being references to um, existing memory. NumPy avoids copying it at all costs. You have to think about that. When you do a reshape and, and you assign a new variable name, it actually points to the same memory location. So it's the same memory, but interpreted in different ways. So if you run this here, you can see here that the memory location of A here is something here in memory. It is kind of random when depending on the time of day you run the code. But you can see here, if I do memory of flat here, it's the same memory location. So A flat is just a reinterpretation of A, but as a, a row vector or a column vector here. Four rows and uh, four rows and one. It's the same data. So if I modify one of them, uh, the other one would change its code. So for example, if I run this one here, you can see here that I changed A00 to 42. You just see here that A flat also changes. And that is because it tries to, at all costs, avoid doing copies. Because these the array can potentially be millions of, of uh, rows and columns. So you don't want to, in a simple uh, array operation, do a reallocation of all memory and, and recreate that. So that's why it tries to avoid that. But if you don't want that behavior, you use the same method that we used yesterday. You use the copy method. So copy makes, makes a copy of the array and, uh, with a new. So this makes a new reallocation. In this case here, C is a copy of A. I changed the C uh, first row and, and second row. Sorry. But I also have to mention that indexing compared to MATLAB, indexing in, in an array is zero based. MATLAB is start from one. So the first row is zero. Second, first column is also zero. But you can see here that the, the, the array looks like this. I assigned the um, first row and first column to 84. You can see here the memory is 584. Uh, A is still 936 and 42. So now we, they are disconnected. So the copy here created a copy of A uh, to continue working. Um, here. Here's some other examples here of how you can reshape things, different sizes. Uh, also note that during um, this reshaping is not the same thing as doing transpose. So if you want to transpose of an array, you should use the empty.transpose function. That will, it will give you a mathematical transpose of an, of an array. Um, you can also uh, resize. A resize that always means a reallocation. So if you have an array here, four by uh, two by two, and I, I do a resize of base, this will be an um, expanded version of. of of a base, but with repeated numbers. So what it does here is actually, it takes the numbers that it and just repeats them in the array and resizes the, the array to the, to the shape that it wants. Um, and of course, the way we create the arrays up until now 
is kind of not very good when you want to create really large arrays in, in different ways. So uh, there are some functions to create arrays, and they are very similar to the ones that you have in MATLAB. So if you want to create an array that is uh, filled with zeros, uh, there is a function called np.zeros, and then you give the shape that you want to have in brackets like this, and it will create um, array four by four with filled with zeros. Uh, you can also specify the data type here, four by four, in just like the array command, and it creates an integer array. So by default, it uses it creates a float floating point zero array. Uh, you can also uh, create objects for so CCs or uh, the number one. So there is a once function here, same parameters as for the zeros. Uh, you can also create. In this way, you can quickly create arrays with a signed a certain number. So uh, ones will only create ones in the array, but you, you, if you multiply, uh, the multiplication will be done element wise. So if you do this, you will get an array filled with the number you want. So that is also something we're going to hear. So many of the operations you can do with multiplication, division, plus addition is you can operates on element level. So you, every every element will be multiplied with 42. So this is a common through the entire NumPy that you can do this kind of uh, operations on. You don't have the loop, you, it will do operations on the entire array. Uh, you can create array ranges using, so we have a range command in normal Python, now we have a range, which is, stands for array range, it works in the same way. In this case, you will get an array instead of a list from zero to nine. This is also a way of, if you want to have an array filled with numbers from zero to uh, 99, you can do uh, np.reshape, a range 100, and then you reshape it with 10 by 10. So np range will create an array with zero to 99 values. Then you do a reshape of that, and it returns you an array of 10 by 10 going from zero to 99. So this is a very efficient way of quickly creating a large array that goes from zero to 99. You can also uh, give it a, a range a start and end value, just like the range here. So the first one would go from minus 10 to 10, but not including 10. And you can have a step as well. And you can also, of course, uh, tell it what kind of data type you should create. Uh, it's also possible to create identity arrays. So, so the identity matrix here can be created by so 10 by 10, um, and you get a diagonal one zero and a diagonal. I think you can specify two here if we're moving. Uh, one thing, uh, if you want to create uh, plot something that we will come into later here, you, you, uh, the A range is not the most suitable to create ranges of values. Uh, so to, if you want to create something uh, going from zero to one with a certain number of values, you should use lean space instead. And that will create an array with a certain number of elements and it will automatically interpolate between the values you say here. So here I will create an interpolation between zero and one with 10 elements and the next one with 20 elements. And that can be useful for many, many cases when you want to um, plot, for example, and, and you want to have the last value included as well. So in this case here, you can see I have zero, but I also are guaranteed to have one part of the, the sequence. And being here, uh, one point zero is, is part of the sequence. Here. So this, this is similar to the MATLAB command where you put zero and the step length and then the end value. Uh, yeah. So lean space corresponds to the MATLAB thing. Uh, you can do array expressions as well. Um, so here I have a array with just a linear variation in it. Uh, if you do a array plus a number, it will add that number to all the elements in the array. You see here, it will add to every element. You can do element-wise multiplication. 
You can call the built-in NumPy functions in the NumPy library using np.sim, and it will calculate the sign value of each value in the array and return you that, that array. You can, of course, negate an array. You can add two arrays together to create a new array. Um, and also, in many cases, the sizes will not have to be the same. Uh, it could just repeat and add, uh, add it repeatedly to the, the array that you create. Uh, so, matrix multiplication. So, uh, arrays are not matrices, they are arrays. You can have one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional, four dimensional arrays. But if you want to, want to work with matrices, uh, or treat an array as a matrix, there are some uh, function operators to, to do those operations. So if you want to do a matrix multiplication, you can use the dot operator or the app operator to multiply. So if you to, uh, multiply two with a normal uh, multiplication operator, you get element-wise multiplication. If you want to uh, want a matrix multiplication, you use the at operator instead or a dot a. Um, then you can have um, slices of, if you, you can, like you did with lists, you can uh, access the elements in different ways. So uh, individual elements, you use just like the list, you, you give it brackets here to access different parts. So a one dimensional array, you just give it just like a list, an index. Uh, if it's two-dimensional, you can either use the syntax bracket, bracket, or bracket with a comma sign between them. And as I said before, indexing is zero-based. So it doesn't start with one, it starts with zero. Assignment is the same thing. You can assign a certain index of value, but just by doing this operation here, uh, and a certain element here like this. You can also define subarrays or slices uh, by using a notation here, just like the list start end, start colon, colon end, colon. So here is a index going from one up to four. And we will return you a subarray of that. Also note here the same rules apply again. When you get a subarray, it usually refers to the same memory locations as the, the array that you create a slice from, just to avoid reallocations to memory. So let's try out this example here. So I have a, a range of 25 here. Uh, here is the memory location here, of this one here. And this is the actual memory location in memory of the computer. So then I do a slice here and I get one, two, three, four. This is this section here. And you can see here that there is a difference here of, I think it's eight, which is actually the floating point uh, number here. So, uh, but if you do data here, you see it's part of the same memory block. In so it's actually reusing, it's just a view of the, the previous. Uh, array. So uh, if you assign things in the D array, it will affect the global array as well. I'm just telling you because usually it's really easy to miss, and I did it when I started learning NumPy as well, that actually it goes to really long lengths not to reallocate anything. So it refers to when the first the first break of major stuff is the memory allocation. And if you do slices and summarize. They're, those are views into that, that array. And here are some more uh, examples of subarrays in different places. You can use the minus operator to get a, a lost row, lost column, for example. Different um, ways of referring to them. Another thing is also that you can mix and match. Uh, lists and arrays. So, for example, if you if you want to assign a, a row in a an array, you can just give it a list of items like this. 
this doesn't have to be an array. Same thing here, problem number two, and just assign it like this. So um, there are kind of compatible lists and arrays. You can loop over them in the same way as you do with them. Um, all as well. There are also, uh, because it's um, Python is an object oriented language, there is a lot of methods that associate with the arrays that we can use. So, for example, there, if you have an array, you can do a sum using the dot sum. So, in this case, it sums all elements and returns them the sum of all of them. Uh, you can summarize sum over columns, and you can sum over um, rows as well by specifying zero or one in the sum uh, method. Same thing really is regards to you can do product, so calculate the product of the entire array, and also product of the columns and products of the rows. So uh, here in the final part here, I will look at, there is actually uh, a, special, a special data type called matrix. Uh, I know it's, going, it's being deprecated in later versions, not but they don't, they don't put this in use, but matrix is a, it's a specialization of an array that has operators for matrix multiplication. So it's a bit easier to do expressions with, with matrices. So in this case here, for example, you can do a dot t, that is the transpose of A. A uh, multiplied by X, that is a matrix multiplier of A and X. And you can do A dot inverse with dot A dot I here. But I, I would recommend you to use, try to use arrays as well, uh, instead of this, because this will disappear from NumPy at some point. Um, so NumPy also contains uh, a lot of functions for efficiently reading and writing arrays. And uh, so, for example, in MATLAB, you can do uh, you can save a math file with the data with the matrix. Uh, this is the same thing here. So uh, you can do save here the file name and the the array you want to save, and it stores that into a dot npy file. And if you look at the folder here, you can see here that it's now I have an X MPY and Y MPI file. And if we look into that file, you can see this is a binary version of the array. So it's it's stored in a, in a quite compact um, fashion. Reading the files, it's also very easy. You just do X equals MP.load and the file name that we stored previously. And you can see here that I get the data back from that. This is something I would do next to the matplotlib library, uh, which is uh, um, similar, gives you the same functions that you have in MATLAB for plotting. Um, I will, I will uh, make that lecture available so you can look at it before I do the lecture as well. It's, it's quite easy to use. Uh, you can use file objects with NumPy file as well. So you can open a file and you can let the save function save to that file instead of saving it to a separate file. So in this way, you can save multiple arrays into a single file. And you can also uh, load them from a single file. Uh, it's also possible to read and write text files. In this case, I, I downloaded there's a, this is a data file of um, a vector field. Uh, and the format of that file looks like this. And this is not uncommon to see in many numerical colors. You have a header here that defines, for example, uh, these are the variables contained in this data set. It's uh, 96 by 65 by 48. Um, it's a block of it's a volume uh, points. And then you have a lot of numbers like this um, separated with set with spaces. And if you want to read in, read that, you can do that in Python and, and, and loop line by line and process that. But Python is not really good at loops. Uh, if you if you want to read this, you can actually use NumPy and, and the C routines in the NumPy library to really read these files very quickly. So there is a load load text function. You give it the file name, 
And it has an option here. The first parts here are not interesting. These are not data. So you can tell it, skip the first two lines and just read the rest as uh, an array. So let's see what happens here. You can see here that it uh, read a file that is 299,520 lines long. It has six columns. You can see it did it in one second. So it's really fast doing it. And you can see here the first row here, you have the numbers that are part of that file. You have zero, minus one, um, zero, and seven. So instead of doing that in loop, this is, I would say, 20, 30 times faster than doing the loop in Python. You can also uh, save the uh, same way as you read this file. So, so I have created here a random 10 by 4 array, and then I can just save it to a text array here. And you can see here that you have uh, this is what, what it wrote to the file. So it, it writes in the highest position it can for as many decimal points as it can to kind of preserve the position of, of, the, of the data. And then you can uh, also say that I want to have it uh, you know, with a certain delimiter. So instead of spaces here, it stores it with uh, commas between. You can also format it if you want in different ways. So let's see here that I have uh, four decimal points instead of full position. You can add a header or footer to this file like this. So uh, this is one way of, of quickly writing files. And, and finally, I will be a bit about binary files as well. So up until now, all the files we have in process have been text files. So basically, the lines of text with rows with new lines. Uh, many of the files that you will encounter in real life are binary. Images, for example, JPEGs, PNG files, those are all binary files. And we can write, read and write those in Python as well in NumPy. So I will use a module called ImageIO, which is a module for reading and writing uh, images. So in this case, I will download a, an image here. So this is a PNG file, and I want to convert that into an array for do some image processing, for example. The first thing I have to do is read that file and get an array uh, of that data. So in this case here, I have um, image I image read, and I better to read this file. And image IO knows about what how to read different uh, file formats like the PNG files and so on. And that just read it in here, and, and then we'll look at what we get. So you can see here it read. Uh, I got an array here that had three hundred fifty nine by five hundred by three. So this is an image with three image components. So three is the red, green, blue. Uh, so three images that has the different parts separated. Uh, okay, so now I have to change this function here because it's deprecated. Uh, and now, now I can do, uh, so if I have an array, I can write that to binary file uh, as well. So to find it, you would produce a raw image with the data. So there's no formatting of that. It's just binary data to this. So I have this raw file here. So if I want to read that raw binary file into NumPy, I can do that as well. I can do from file. I can say here that this is a read from this file. And I, I know that each data type, each number is an unsigned integer of eight. So I know that I can read it in, and now it reads it in. But now you can see it's just a one single array because the raw file doesn't contain any information about the size of the image. Uh, it's just the binary data without any structure. Uh, but now we have it as a vector and we can do a reshape like we did before. So we reshape it because we know the size of it. We know that it has 359 by 500 image size. It has three uh, color components. 
So we reshape it into an array again, uh, and then we plot it, display it on the screen. So we went from a PD image to an array to a raw data file that was saved as a binary. We read that binary file back, and we reinterpreted it as an image here with the reshape function. And you can see here as I find, I plotted this image here as well. And finally, so this, this is a bit of uh, extra information here, but there is also a possibility to read files from the internet. In mostly the same way that you do with uh, uh, reading from files locally. In this case here, I use something called a data source. I open it just like a file object, and I can read it using the image. Here I get a file pointer here, which I can pass to the normal image read functions and plot it. So it went, it goes out to the internet, downloads the file, and uh, writes it uh, writes a file pointer, a file object which you can use just like a normal file. So now you can see here this this is a file that was located on the internet. I downloaded, opened it, and read it into Python for processing. So Files doesn't have to be local on the computer. They can be somewhere on the net and you can use Python to download it and make it process them. And finally, you need to know how to solve equation systems. So um, if you want to solve a, a system of equations here, you can do that. There is a built-in solver in the linear module of NumPy that can solve a linear equation of the type AX equals. So this is the uh, for your project now. There will be we will use the Kalfen solve command, which is similar to this one here, but can handle boundary conditions as well. So this it was a lot of information here, <laughs> but but it's uh, the worksheet is what you have this as due on Tuesday, and I will do the matplotlib lecture on Monday. Um, so you will have all the information you need, and then we will start with the code film part next week. But look at the uh, download them. You can experiment all the examples yourself. You can try out and modify the parameters here uh, to uh, see how it works. So that was all for me today.